Grace unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord Jesus dictated to the Apostle John on the island of Patmos where Apostle John had been banished. Seven different letters to seven different churches. All of them located in the western part of present-day Turkey. They start in, Roman, in uh, Revelation chapter 2, and those seven letters continue through Revelation chapter 3. Five of those letters have strong words of reprimand and a calling to repentance because of what the congregation is doing or what it was, is allowing to be taught or done in its midst. Two of those letters contain no word of reprimand or call to special repentance. They are simply words of encouragement and support that are expressed for those two congregations. The second letter is the letter written to the congregation in the city of Smyrna. Smyrna is about midway east-west or north-south on the western end of present-day Turkey. Words of positive encouragement and strength to them. When you think of what must have been like in that congregation. Congregation's not perfect, but it was a good congregation. What was going on in their midst? What were their lives like? What was their church like? Because it's a, a good congregation. We might be a little surprised as we hear the words of the Lord Jesus that were dictated and directed for this congregation. As we think about the words of Jesus for a model congregation, they are a little surprising. The letter begins, as practically as all the letters begin, with a word of introduction to the angel of the church in Smyrna, right? That word angel in the original language has the idea of being a messenger, probably is referring then to the pastor of that congregation as the one who communicates God's message and is responsible for God's message being shared with those people. And then the source of this letter. These words, these are the words of him who was the first and the last, who died and came to life again. These are the words, the, the words that John is being given to write down, the, the one that's dictating to him. These are the words of him who is the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Outside of him there is nothing, everything is within him. And the one who died and rose again. Clearly this has to be Jesus Christ. He is the eternal God. And he is also the one who died and rose from the dead. It is the ascended Lord who rules all things, who is the head of the church, who is now communicating with this particular congregation and is giving the words directly to the Apostle Paul what he is to write down for this congregation. After identifying from whom these words are coming, he says, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. The people of this congregation were suffering afflictions, burdens, hardships, difficulties. It becomes clear in the next couple of sentences that the reason for these difficulties were simply because they believed in Jesus. These were burdens they could avoid if they wanted to. All they had to do was deny Jesus or not associate with people who believed in Jesus. And they could escape this burden, this hardship that was crushing down on their life. But they didn't want to. 
because they didn't want to deny Jesus. And he says, I know your extreme poverty. In the original language, there are two words in that language that are used to describe poor people. One word to probably what we would describe as poor people, and the other word, the word of our text, to describe people that are, have less than poor people. <laughs> He's talking about people who are the poorest of the poor. They have nothing. Whether they are in that situation because of economic discrimination, or they are in that situation because they were the lowest rung of a group of people that were simply slaves, the vast majority of this congregation was made up of people who had deep hardships in their life and were extremely poor. And then Jesus' words to these people is really kind of dumbfounding. Because his very next words are, yet you are rich. Happened about midsummer. Another pastor called me, wanted to talk about something. And I knew that this particular pastor was uh, very involved in our world mission efforts, had been in several of our world mission fields, and mentioned that, that my wife, Diane, was going to be going to Africa to teach vacation Bible school at three of our mission congregations there later that sum last this past summer. He said, those people are just amazing. They have nothing. Yet they know they have everything. Because they have Jesus. They are happiest people you're ever going to meet. Because their happiness is centered in Jesus Christ and what Jesus brings to people's hearts and lives. I'm told of a missionary's wife several years ago that heard about a native pastor's wife serving in one of the outlying villages who had a reputation. Her reputation was for wisdom. The missionary's wife thought, it would be really good for me to, to get to know this woman because she would help me understand the culture. She would give me wisdom and how I deal and interrelate, how I could be a positive partner alongside of my husband as he's serving as a missionary in this foreign culture. But she was very hesitant to invite the lady over to her house. You see, the setting is, our missionaries in Africa have far, far less stuff than we do. But they got a whole lot more stuff than the national pastors do, serving out in the villages. She was concerned. How's this woman going to react to all this? Will she think I'm showing off? What will she think? What, what might this all entail? And could there be negative repercussions? But she invited the lady over so that uh, they could get to know one another and she could learn of her wisdom. In the course of that conversation, the, the wise lady asked the missionary's wife, uh, how many children do you have? She said, uh, we have three. She said to her, I have six. Would you like some of my children? And the missionary's wife said, no. God gave you those children. Those are blessings God has given to you. I don't want your children. God has entrusted them to you. And the woman looked up at her and said, and I don't want your stuff. 
God gave that to you. And you are responsible for that. That wise woman understood it, didn't she? Jesus is the basis of everything. He's the center of it all. And if you got Jesus, you got everything. And if you don't have Jesus, like the rich man that Jesus told the story about, you got nothing. Because eternal judgment is your reward that you are receiving. Jesus, as he writes to these people, says, you're rich. Anybody who looks at you from a worldly perspective thinks you got nothing and you got the worst life in the world. But Jesus says, you're rich. Because you have a relationship with the eternal God. He continued as he wrote to these people. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do you notice there twice? Jesus says, I know. I know all about what's going on in your life. I know exactly what's happening. None of this is news to me. <laughs> and I know what those Jews are planning to do to you. He says they're not really Jews, so technically, ethnically, they were Jews. But they didn't believe in Jesus as the Messiah. They weren't like the children of Abraham. Because Abraham believed God's promise. See, the New Testament a number of times makes the point that all believers are the true children of Abraham. Because they believe like Abraham believed. They have the same content of faith that Abraham had. They are, the New Testament says, the true Israelites. Because Israel was to be the people of God. And if they didn't believe in the Messiah, no matter what their ethnic background was, they weren't the people of God. New Testament believers are the people of God. They're the Israelites. And they are the ones that are the true children of God. These people, they're from the synagogue of Satan, Jesus said. Because they were the ones that were making their lives really miserable. Maybe in conjunction with the Roman government. But they had a hand in it all. And it's not just the present that Jesus says he knows about. He said, continued, do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you. And you will suffer persecution for ten days. He knows the future before it happens. And he doesn't mince any words. I know what's going to be happening. Satan, working through human beings, is going to cause a persecution to break out. Describes it as 10 days. Frequently in the book of Revelation, a number is symbolic, so perhaps it's depicting a short, relatively short period of time. But things are going to get worse in terms of the condition of their physical life. Jesus knows all about it. But he says, don't be afraid. Because you got everything when you got Jesus. Do we have to say, Lord, forgive me. When I spend uh, and worry so much about career and job and finance and all the stuff, forgive me, Lord, when I really haven't had you first and what my life is really all about, forgive me, Lord. I have sinned. 
And that Savior comes because he suffered and died for us and for all to pay for all of our guilt. And in assurance of his forgiveness, he says, don't be afraid. Oh, maybe things won't get better in our lot in life. But we can be assured Jesus knows all about it, doesn't he? Do you find that comforting? To realize Jesus knows exactly what's going on in my life. He knows the hardships and the difficulty that is there. But I still have everything when I know him and his forgiveness and his promises. Oh, there's a tremendous amount of comfort in those simple words, I know, because we can apply them to ourselves. And we can apply the promise that he makes to believers because he says in the very next words, be faithful even to the point of death and I will give you the crown of life. Be faithful. Continue to follow Jesus. Continue to trust in him. And even if that involves somebody killing you because of your faith, be faithful. I will give you the crown of life. See, there are far worse things that can happen to a person than being martyred for the Christian faith. And that's to fall away from the Christian faith and lose eternal life forever. Be faithful, he says, in me. And you don't earn eternal life. Even enduring persecution and being a martyr, he doesn't say, you deserve eternal life then. He says, I'll give you the crown of life. It's still totally by grace, undeserved, that that promise is made with absolute assurance that we can have total confidence in. And then he captures it all with the final words. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. When people are born into this world, they're spiritually dead. They're born sinful. They're separated from God. They have no relationship with God. This morning, we witnessed a miracle of God as he promises through the power of baptism and that word spoken and water applied, the Spirit creates faith in a little child. How unbelievable is that? But yet true. So that that child becomes a child of God. Where there was spiritual death, there's now spiritual life. As faith in Jesus Christ is generated within that person. The person that remains faithful in Jesus continues to believe and follow, trust in him. The second death has no power at all over that person. See, the first death was spiritual. The second death is physical. But that death has no power over the believer at all because we are given the crown of life. We are given life everlasting, given only to the believer in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior from sin. When you thought of that congregation several minutes ago, and I ask you to try to imagine, what do you think was going on in that congregation, in their lives, with their ministry? We have a tendency to think of it so worldly, don't we? 
But God always looks at the heart. This was a good congregation. Not because their earthly lives were going wonderfully and they looks like they're going to have a rosy future. In fact, the opposite. But this was a good congregation because their hearts were centered in Jesus. And they knew we got everything because we got Jesus and the spiritual and eternal life that he gives. Now there's a good congregation. Continue to be faithful in him. Following, living in him. And those wondrous promises are true and can be relied on for each one, every believer in Jesus Christ. Amen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.